Okay, well, well, let's make a start. Depending on where you're watching from, good evening, good afternoon, or good morning. My name is Alan, Alan Packwood. I'm the director of the Churchill Archive Centre at Churchill College, Cambridge, home to Sir Winston's personal archive. And I'm delighted to welcome you to this International Churchill Society event. The International Churchill Society exists to promote interest in the life, times and legacy of Sir Winston Churchill. And you can find out more via their website, winstonchurchill.org, including how to join. And I want to thank Kat Lee for running this Zoom event this evening, and also Arnie Sigurdsson, the president of the Churchill Club of Iceland, um, for suggesting and facilitating this occasion. It is 80 years since the first wartime meeting of President Roosevelt and Winston Churchill, a meeting which took place in Placentia Bay off the coast of Newfoundland between the 9th and the 12th of August, 1941, almost four months before the entry of the United States into the Second World War. It was a meeting which marked an escalation of American involvement in the conflict, especially perhaps in the defense of the Atlantic. And it was a meeting which culminated in the Atlantic Charter Declaration. Not a statement of war aims, because of course America was not yet in the war, but rather a set of principles for a new world order. Those countries that signed up to the declaration became known as the United Nations. The charter wasn't a treaty, so it wasn't signed by Churchill and Roosevelt, but it was broadcast to the world on the 14th of August, 1941. And two days later, on the 16th of August, 80 years ago today, Churchill made landfall in Iceland. He was on his way back um, to Britain. But this visit, as we will hear, was really an extension of that Atlantic meeting. It was a deeply symbolic and important moment. And I'm delighted to say that to discuss this, we have two expert historians. Professor David Reynolds is Emeritus Professor of International History at Cambridge and has written several important books on Churchill and the Second World War, including the Wolfson History Prize winning in Command of History, and more recently, The Kremlin Letters, the definitive edition of the Churchill, Roosevelt and Stalin wartime correspondence. And David is joined by President Gudni Johannesson of Iceland, an expert on the modern history of his country, who's written on the Cod Wars, on the recent financial crisis, and who since 2016 has been the sixth president of Iceland. Now, of course, Churchill said that the future would be kind to him because he would write that history. So presumably then he would have approved of an historian who was actually making that history. And of course, um, Goodney won a second term um, in 2020 and has consistently enjoyed the sort of approval ratings that Churchill and other modern politicians would die for. Um, so I'm thrilled that President Hannison is going to start us off this evening with some reflections on the events of 80 years ago uh, and their significance of Iceland. And that then, of course, will lead naturally into a conversation with David. But we want all of you listening to be part of that conversation. So do start submitting your questions using the Zoom Q&A function. And we'll try and come to as many of those questions as we can during the second half of the session. But with that, enough from me and over to David to start things off. Well, uh, I don't often have the chance to talk to a president. So Mr. President, it's a pleasure to be talking to you. Um, as a fellow historian, but also as uh, somebody who is in a position of high office and understands some of those responsibilities. Um, as Alan said, we're going to talk about the um, Atlantic uh, meeting and charter in a moment, but let's start with this, this meeting in Iceland, because I think for many of the people on this, uh, this Zoom, this won't be a very familiar part of the story. So can you tell us a bit more about Churchill's visit to Iceland uh, yes. 80 years ago? Yes, thank you very much. And thank you, Alan, as well, for 
those uh, introductory words and welcome all to this uh, uh, this seminar. Uh, I I'm a historian by profession, yes, and uh, and I used to work in academia, but the Second World War was uh, not my speciality. But I've always been fascinated with uh, with the importance of individuals versus the sort of stronger or more general currents. How how capable are individuals uh, uh, of of how how yeah how how well can they influence events? How how important are individuals and uh, and their actions. But uh, you're right, David. I think we need to provide some background. And um, Iceland uh, in uh, 1941. Uh, let's go. Let's go back a bit. Uh, in 1918, Iceland became a sovereign state after centuries of uh, Danish rule. Uh, and during the interwar years, the years uh, after the First World War, uh, military strategists. Uh, foresaw growing importance of Iceland lying in the middle of the yeah. North Atlantic, an important stepping stone for uh, for aviation, for flights between uh, Europe and North America. And this could be important in, a, in any future war. And this is something that people realized in, in Germany as well, in Nazi Germany. So uh, uh, in the 1930s, there was growing interest in Germany, in Iceland. Uh, not only in military terms, but also also uh, in in other aspects. Uh, uh, Heinrich Himmler, the SS chief, was fascinated by Norse mythology and uh, believed in uh, all of this uh, nonsense about the about the superiority of the of the of the so-called Aryan race, and uh, felt that up in Iceland uh, you would see uh, you would see the uh, the uh, promised land, as it were, and uh, the Nazi Germany's envoy here in Iceland, uh, a man called uh, called uh, Gerlach Werner Gerlach, he was also of this opinion. He came to Iceland with high hopes of meeting this uh, this uh, superior race, but was sorely disappointed. Uh, he said that the Icelanders, the men, were lazy drunkards. And the, uh, the women, they were, yeah, here you can see in the photo, you can see Reykjavik in 1930, and you can see the bay where uh, where Churchill uh, sailed on uh, in towards Reykjavik in 1941. So, uh, so you had this Nazi uh, 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 image of Iceland and, and the clear military interest. So, uh, uh, in 19, yeah, here you can see the, the German envoy, uh, Werner uh, Gerlach. Who said that the Icelandic men were lazy drunkards and the Icelandic women were just uh, uh, cheap? Uh, uh, yes, I'm trying to find a more polite word than he used. But they painted themselves, painted their lips, and painted their uh, their uh, fingernails just in trying to imitate some cheap Hollywood actresses. Or so. that was the phrase he used. Anyway, anyway, uh, in 1939 the German airline Lufthansa applied for landing rights in Iceland, you know, simply for, for commercial flights, they said, but everybody understood the military implications and this, this application was politely turned down. Uh, and then war breaks out, Iceland maintains its uh, neutrality, uh, continues to trade with Nazi Germany, but then in the spring of 1940, and uh, uh, you know, I won't recount this in, in close detail, but in, in the spring of 1940, uh, Denmark is uh, occupied by the Nazis and uh, Norway uh, follows. And people here in Iceland think, well, what happens next? Uh, Denmark is uh, overrun on the 9th of April. So come with me, come with me to Reykjavik on the uh, morning of the 10th of May, 1940. So in the early hours, People here in Reykjavik hear airplanes flying over uh, over the capital, and you can see ships approaching in, in the bay uh, outside Reykjavik. And we have this anecdote that the Prime Minister of Iceland, Ólafur Tors, was woken up in the middle of the night and uh, told by uh, by someone, Ólafur, 
there are planes flying above Reykjavik now. Uh, something is about to happen, some unknown planes. And then slightly later, he asked, well, can you see where they're from? And the reply was, sir, I think they're British. I know they're British. And then he said, well, then we can just, uh, then, we, then I can fall asleep again. Then we're okay, then we're safe. But Iceland was occupied by British forces on the 10th of May, 1940. And this was, a, this was an occupation. The government of Iceland formally protested this uh, breach of Iceland's neutrality. But of course, everyone or practically everyone in positions of power, at least, was satisfied and glad that uh, uh, the occupying force was British, not German. And there followed uh, a period of, uh, of uh, uh, British presence here. And uh, uh, when we reach uh, the summer of 1941, momentous uh, developments take place. In July, 7th of July, 1941, U.S. forces uh, join British forces here. There is a defense agreement between uh, Britain uh, between the U.S. And, and Iceland on the protection of Iceland, and this is, uh, I believe, uh, a very important event in the uh, in the history of the Second World War. In the sense that this was a clear step uh, by the U.S. that they were. Uh, uh, going to uh, uh, be more present uh, in the in the war and um, uh, a clear signal that uh, Winston Churchill for one certainly appreciated that uh, Britain was not going to be uh, got not going to be um, abandoned by the Americans. So this is a sort of backdrop to uh, August 1941. So I hope you get the clear picture of a, of a neutral island state willing to stand outside uh, military action. But people here clearly, clearly realize that that is impossible as the war progresses. Uh, happy to see if anyone has to be here, that it's the British first and then the Americans. And then, of course, the... Uh, the visit takes place. Now, I don't know, David, if you want to uh, intervene now and tell us a bit about the Atlantic Charter, because that is, of course, where, where uh, Churchill uh, was when, uh, when he sailed onward to Britain and, and made this, uh, this stop in, in Iceland, which I am happy to uh, describe further as well, we why move along. You, why don't you finish the story? Because I think yeah. people are really fascinated by this, uh, this uh, story that begins with the 10th of May, which of course was the day in 1940 when Churchill became yes. Prime Minister. And exactly. And on through this, uh, this development during the war. So um, uh, why don't you finish the story yeah. of Churchill's visit and then I'll backtrack to the Atlantic meeting. Definitely. So we have Churchill arriving in Iceland. Uh, uh, on the morning of the uh, Saturday, 16th of August, 1941. And you can see him here in the in Kvalfjörður, uh, the Wales Fjord, uh, slightly north of Reykjavik, the capital. Uh, he arrived on the uh, battleship uh, Prince of Wales. Uh, and in Kvalfjörður, which was a uh, which was a meeting place for the convoys, the, uh, the allied convoys that sailed uh, from uh, uh, Iceland, they convened in Iceland, then and sailed onwards uh, uh, for the remainder of the war uh, to, uh, to the Soviet Union, bringing vital supplies to, to, the, to the Soviet side. Anyway, this is where he is on the morning of the uh, Saturday, the 16th of August. And then he, uh, Churchill moves to a, you know, onto a Canadian destroyer that takes him to Reykjavik, uh, the capital. I believe you can see that uh, destroyer there, uh, bottom right hand side, but I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure. So it was, of course, top secret that uh, Winston Churchill was uh, arriving in Iceland. Uh, but a few days before, rumor got out that some very important person was arriving because you had to prepare for this momentous event. Uh, so uh, in the morning, people realize that this very important person is none other than uh, uh, Winston Churchill. So uh, people gather uh, downtown 
and uh, in the uh, uh, early morning or late morning, 11 o'clock, Churchill arrives in Reykjavik Harbor, uh, goes to uh, Parliament, uh, and Parliament Square is full of Icelanders uh, who salute uh, this uh, war hero. And uh, there is a spirit of uh, joy uh, in, in Reykjavik. Now, uh, Churchill uh, spoke to the crowd outside Parliament from the balcony uh, on the Parliament building. And now, apparently, uh, not everyone, of course, not everyone understood English and, uh, and the loudspeakers didn't work that well. So it is disputed whether actually the crowd uh, could comprehend everything that Churchill said, but they cheered uh, joyfully uh, throughout the speech and uh, gave him a loud uh, applause at the end of this, his speech. <coughs> Excuse me. And his, uh, his words were all about uh, how, uh, how, the, um, how uh, it was vital that everybody joined hands in the, in the war effort and full of gratitude to the people of Iceland for, um, for doing their part in the war. Uh, so uh, he was very well received. Then uh, after having met with the prime minister and other dignitaries, uh, Churchill uh, went onward and inspected the, uh, the British and the US soldiers in Iceland, actually also Canadian uh, uh, regiments and the Norwegian regiment. Uh, it is still to this day, the biggest military parade in the history of Iceland. Uh, as many of listeners will maybe know, Iceland does not have a military and uh, no military tradition. Uh, and then uh, later on in the Cold War, we had US presence here, but uh, this is still, like I said, the biggest military parade in the history of Iceland. And uh, the soldiers noticed, many of them, that uh, uh, Churchill was very, uh, uh, very, uh, he was in good spirits. He spoke to them, he encouraged them to go on. And was, uh, was, it was a very uplifting experience. Uh, Churchill had lunch at uh, Höfði House, which is um, an old house uh, 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 at that time uh, housing the, uh, the British Embassy. Uh, I think I remember that correctly. And um, uh, it was a good lunch, uh, we were told. And uh, in preparation, for Church's visit, somebody got the brilliant idea of, of getting a cat, a cat to be present uh, when Churchill uh, went to the went to went to that building, because uh, people knew of uh, Churchill's affection for for cats. So so uh, a cat was brought in and was purring in in in, in Church's lap uh, throughout the lunch, and and he was really uh, uh, happy. To, to have that uh, companion throughout the lunch. And in those pictures, lovely pictures of, um, of, of Churchill in Iceland, a very happy atmosphere that the president mentioned. Um, uh, Churchill though had a lot on his mind uh, on his way back to Britain because that meeting with Roosevelt had not gone as well as he'd hoped. It turned out quite differently in fact. Um, remember that uh, on the, uh, in the in the spring of 1941, Churchill is still very anxious about the war, about the pressures in the Atlantic on Britain's supply lines, very anxious um, still about the longer term possibility of invasion. Uh, Churchill uh, is relieved that on the 22nd of June 1941, Hitler turns east against the Soviet Union, but he is not confident that this is more than a short breathing space. Indeed, he tells President Roosevelt on the 25th of July um, uh, that he'd ordered anti-invasion uh, preparations in Britain to be at what he calls concert pitch on the 1st of September 41. So Churchill's not taking anything for granted about Russia. Um, 
uh, when the, there is talk of going or uh, having a meeting with the president, which has been uh, in the offing and under discussion for some months, um, before Churchill leaves London, he writes to the Queen uh, a line or two, and he says, I do not think our friend would have asked me to go so far for what must be a meeting of worldwide importance unless he had in mind some further forward step, some further forward step, which is Churchill's way of saying, you know, maybe he's finally going to talk, uh, tell me about a declaration of war. Um, and uh, so Churchill goes with high hopes, but when he gets there and we can see the, the meeting, uh, I think that we do have one or two images of Churchill meeting with Roosevelt, um, they, uh, there's obviously tremendous uh, importance and symbolism to do with sitting there with the President of the United States, still neutral, sitting there with chiefs of staff behind him. And uh, I think we have another picture of, the, of, of Churchill and the uh, Roosevelt and the military. So this is tremendously important symbolically. But Roosevelt is telling Churchill that he's not in any position to declare war. He, constitutionally, of course, the president can't. Um, uh, and it, he's in no position to go to Congress and ask them for a declaration of war. What he tells Churchill is that, uh, you know, he's going to try and be more and more provocative in the Atlantic. And that's part of the reason for extending US naval support and patrolling as far as Iceland. But and he may be, you know, may be able to provoke an incident, but he hasn't got, uh, he is no, in no position to uh, declare war. And Churchill is rather disheartened about this, and, and he makes that clear when he gets home. But what he gets instead, not a declaration of war, but a declaration of war aims, because uh, uh, sprung upon the British is this idea of uh, a statement of common values between the United States, a neutral and a and Britain, a belligerent, about the shape of the post-war world. This is something what Roosevelt wants, uh, the Americans want to set down some values. Uh, it isn't, um, it isn't um, uh, something that uh, they're prepared for. Indeed, uh, Sir Alexander Cadogan, who's the senior British diplomat with Churchill, um, uh, I think is always resents the fact that um, basically uh, the Churchill came down and ruined his breakfast, uh, his bacon and eggs one morning by telling Cadogan that he had to draw up a, 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 an outline draft for the Americans before that church service. And um, you know, that was regarded as very ungentlemanly conduct to ruin uh, uh, Cadogan's uh, bacon and eggs. But anyway, he did his, his, his best uh, they produced a draft, it was haggled over for a number of hours in various meetings. This is what became the so-called Atlantic Charter. But what's interesting about it is that the, um, the, uh, one of the most contentious parts of this, in a way that Churchill and Cadogan did not expect, was um, uh, the, the third uh, item on the, uh, the uh, list of, of values. Um, about um, uh, 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 making sure that sovereign rights and self-government were handed uh, back to those who'd lost it, which was a, a statement about those people who'd been occupied by Nazi Germany, countries like Denmark and Norway. But that third point also said, they respect Britain and America, the rights of all peoples to choose the form of government uh, under which they uh, wish uh, to live. Uh, Churchill did not expect that that would be uh, applied as it was very quickly to countries like India, who said this is, a, uh, this is an invitation to, for us to start moving towards self-government, renewing our claims towards uh, self-government. So this was um, a, a significant example of the way that a declaration which Churchill hadn't really wanted became part of the larger scheme that Roosevelt had for um, thinking about the post-war world. And, and before we hand back to the president, who I think is now back on uh, sound, we can maybe just see briefly the um, text of 
that um, declaration um, typed up, uh, but with additional comments by Churchill in um, the margins in red. Um, so this was a, a draft of that um, uh, 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 that at what became known as the Atlantic Charter at that stage simply called proposed declaration. So that's what Churchill was carrying with him and mulling over when he got to Iceland. Um, and I think we're now able to go back to Iceland and, and finish the story about the cat. Yeah. <laughs> can you hear me now? I hope you yes, can hear definitely. me now. Excellent. Loud Sorry about that. Now, yeah, but it's, you know, it's a, it's a sign that I was just about to finish a story about Hövdi House, uh, this, uh, this house in Reykjavik. Uh, it's haunted. Uh, it's haunted, and, uh, yeah. and that's why, you know, these things happen. That's but right. uh, I had come to the point in my story where uh, Churchill was having this uh, Icelandic cat in his lap, as much as he loved cats, and... Uh, then uh, <clears throat> went uh, off and uh, enjoyed this uh, lunch. You mentioned Cadogan. Cadogan wrote in his diary that it was a lovely lunch. Uh, uh, and then Churchill rushed into have the house again and said goodbye to this 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 wonderful cat that he had uh, had uh, enjoyed enjoyed having with him there. And then went off to to the uh, to to greenhouses outside Reykjavik where he uh, saw firsthand how we use uh, geothermal energy to heat up our homes and how to how to mm. how to grow uh, vegetables and uh, fruits and he was fascinated by this and i understand that it had caused him many problems in the 1930s uh, how to heat up at at uh, some modest cost the the pool that he, that he had at Churchill or somewhere i don't know exactly Charcoal that story greenhouse yeah that's right yeah. yes yes so yes. there you saw you know he saw the solution there and well, he loved gadgets. He was fascinated by all that sort of technology stuff. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And and here in Iceland, we we have always enjoyed uh, how Churchill describes this uh, part of his visit in his in his memoirs, because it comes across as if he uh, sort of saw the the heat underground and how that could be utilized and sort of almost suggested to, to the inhabitants that they could use geothermal energy to heat up their homes, uh, 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 something that we had been doing for, for decades. Yes. Uh, so, uh, so that's how Icelanders remember that story, but it clearly stuck in Churchill's, Churchill's mind. Now, then he went off uh, and had discussions with the head of, of the British forces here, and, uh, and he gave the famous uh, victory sign, and. Uh, and went up to Kvalfjörður, the whale fjord, uh, again, and, and bade goodbye. Now, one important aspect of this is that he was always accompanied uh, by, uh, uh, by uh, representatives of the, of, the, of the U.S. Navy, including uh, Franklin Roosevelt, uh, Jr., which, you know, symbolically demonstrates uh, this uh, growing cooperation between uh, Iceland and the U.S., uh, it was uh, a risky journey to undertake uh, in the summer of 1941 to cross the uh, North Atlantic. Uh, German submarines were everywhere. Uh, it's another demonstration of, of, of Churchill's uh, courage, if you like, or uh, decision not to worry too much about, about uh, whether he would be killed or not in, in action, as it were. Uh, but I, he went safely home, but a few weeks later, uh, submarines, US submarines, uh, German submarines, sorry, uh, sank uh, uh, US warship, the destroyer USS Greer uh, in the North Atlantic. And I, I believe you can, you can uh, claim that that was the first uh, American casualties, military casualties in the Second World War. So everything is moving in the direction of closer U.S. involvement in the war. And when we look back on Churchill's visit, it's not only a, a symbolical uh, uh, part of Iceland's history, it, it demonstrates uh, clearly Iceland's importance uh, during the war. It demonstrates, mm -hmm. uh, I believe, the authorities' willingness to help in the war effort. 
but it's also a very, uh, very uh, important uh, stepping stone, as it were, uh, in, in, in the US journey towards full involvement in the war, although that only yeah. came into effect uh, in December 41 with the, with the uh, attack on Pearl Harbor. So uh, this is how we remember the visit uh, mm -hmm. here in Iceland. And uh, we still have uh, people who remember this visit fondly. Uh, there were, uh, uh, we have stories from, from girls and boys who were uh, present. Uh, one who exclaimed uh, when she saw Churchill, this is Churchill. She just couldn't believe her eyes. And, um, and it is, yeah, it is a moment that is remembered in Icelandic history. And we need to go into questions in a moment, but just to kind of pull the story together or take it on a little further. I mean, one of the things I had the pleasure of, of meeting you in uh, a couple of years ago when I was lecturing in Iceland and so on. And I developed just going round Reykjavik and go, remember going to the National Museum, this very strong sense of a country that had been so influenced in the past by its Norse and its Danish heritage had been very much part of that world. And then suddenly in 4041, is brought into a completely different orbit, this Anglo-American orbit, um, which has had a profound effect on Iceland's history since then. And of course, um, if we fast forward just um, uh, a few years from 1940, 41 to 49, Iceland is one of the founding members of the North Atlantic Treaty. Um, the, you know, the, the airport in the middle of Reykjavik, I think, was built by the British in 1940. <clears throat> the uh, airport that you now go into, very modern and effective, impressive airport in, at Keflavik on the edge of the island, was originally a US uh, base during the Cold War. So it's almost like we're right in this story of, of, of Churchill's visit, right at that fundamental turning point in Icelandic history. Is that how you would see it as well? Yes, I would, uh, I would describe it like that. On the 10th of May 1940, everything changed overnight. Mm. Uh, unemployment vanished, the uh, economic difficulties of the, uh, of the depression and the, uh, and the 1930s vanished overnight. All of a sudden there was employment for everyone. Uh, Icelanders uh, benefited in material terms greatly from the sales of fish to Great Britain throughout the war because mm -hmm. uh, British fishermen were more or less uh, 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 away on war duty. Uh, the uh, presence of thousands of foreign uh, military personnel had a profound effect on Icelandic society. Yeah. Uh, not everything was positive. There was uh, uh, there was um, uh, concern among the uh, upper echelons in society, so to speak, that this would have a negative influence on on the youth of Iceland, uh, women in particular. There was this uh, this patria patriarchy uh, concerns about. Uh, about the future of uh, Iceland, future of Icelandic culture, and so on and so forth. Uh, what effect it would have on Icelandic language and culture to have these thousands of military men on the island. So it's a, it's a complex story in that yeah. regard. But the bottom line is that uh, uh, there was a war going on. And like it or not, even though we're a small island in the middle of the North Atlantic, uh, that distance, that relative isolation, was uh, of no use anymore. Military no. technology and and uh, and uh, other developments dictated that. You had so to move with during the, the Second World War. Iceland was yeah. thrust into the yeah. modern world, as it were. Yeah, good. Okay, well, that's fascinating, and thank you so much. A um, reminder also to people that the Hurfty House that you mentioned, the cat story, was of course it came back in 1986 as the venue for the summit between Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev, uh, another point at which Iceland was very much at the center of world events. But Alan, I think we have uh, 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 one or two questions that you have up your sleeve from the audience. So over Absolutely. to you. Absolutely. Well, let me first um, apologize, Mr. President, and to the audience for the, the sort of slight technical difficulties. Uh, I'm glad to see it. it 
it didn't interrupt the, 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 the flow of the conversation. But the questions have been in flooding in, um, and I've been trying to group them. I think we'll start with questions which sort of um, focus on um, uh, the origins of um, um, the Atlantic Charter trip and, and, and of Churchill's visits to I Iceland. Um, and we have um, a question from Aaron, um, who is curious as to when the actual discussions about replacing British troops in Ireland with in, in Iceland with US Marines occurred. Um, was this first raised by Churchill with Roosevelt, or was it discussed via the, the military staffs? But but how how early on were these discussions um, taking place? Perhaps if we come to you first with this, David. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, off the top of my head, I think this was something that started to be discussed in um, uh, from early 1941. Um, and certainly in the spring of 1941, as part of the American changing hemisphere defense plan. If you remember what Roosevelt was doing was not um, uh, uh, you know, saying directly that he was uh, leaning over to support the United Kingdom, but saying, I'm extending the defensive borders of the United States. The Western hemisphere is simply being pushed further and further into the Atlantic. And that was his, uh, that was this, if you like, the device or the, um, the, the, the fiction that was used um, to say, well, okay, one part of that would be taking over defense for, from uh, the UK at a point where the British are, of course, heavily pressed in North Africa and really don't need to have troops elsewhere if they can be supported. Those American troops, remember, I think it, you saw it in the pictures, they are not that well prepared at this stage. The Americans are still not anywhere near the war, and many of them are wearing old-fashioned World War I British-style helmets as well, you know, not, not the sort of things that you'd see another year later when um, they invade North Africa. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't think I can add much to that. Uh, I believe it was in the uh, already uh, in the late 1941 that uh, that the British could uh, move their forces in some numbers from Iceland because of, naturally the British forces were stretched to the to the limit there. And an interesting point there is also the Icelandic attitude in 1940, 1941, like when the British occupation takes place here in Iceland in, in, in the spring of 1940, it looks as if the Nazis are going to overrun Europe. They are crushing one country after another. And at that stage, there are serious discussions in Iceland. There are politicians and uh, uh, officials wondering whether it would not be best to, to get under some kind of US umbrella as safely as possible. Uh, Let's interpret the Monroe Doctrine so that Free it yeah. so that it encompasses Iceland. And some people even wondered: should we apply for uh, for membership of the U.S.? Would that be the best way to preserve the sovereignty we have already gained? Uh, yeah. So, uh, so uh, we must always remember uh, as well that uh, in 1940, in 1941, uh, the people who had to make momentous decisions did not enjoy the benefit of hindsight that we uh, we enjoy later on. Yeah. And, and I think that leads into a um, couple of um, interesting questions that have come in about then the German attitude um, um, to, to, to these events. So Wilfred de Freitas, um, and he, he asks, given the unannounced arrival of the British uh, and later the Americans, did Germany protest Iceland's neutrality. Um, and then we have perhaps a related question which has come in from Stephen Shaw. Were there, to your knowledge, any German plans for occupying Iceland? And perhaps, Mr. President, if we can start yeah. with you. Yeah, first with the second. Yes, there was. There was a project Icarus or plan Icarus uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, capture Iceland. Uh, it would have involved uh, those big passenger ships. Uh, now I'm trying to recall uh, their names: uh, Europa, Europa and Bremen. So, so they would sail with uh, with forces up to Iceland and also use parachute troopers 
and capture the island in one swift sort of blitzkrieg action. Uh, I think I remember correctly that the German Navy and, and Air Force always thought this would be a very risky operation indeed, uh, as long as, uh, as Britain uh, had uh, superiority in the North Atlantic. And uh, even though Hitler uh, uh, was interested in the idea, it never went to any kind of uh, operational stage. But interest it was, uh, for sure. Uh, and um, uh, the, uh, this is, of course, uh, one of the reasons why, why uh, or the main reason that, uh, that uh, British forces uh, arrived here in the, in, the, in the spring of 1940, to be ahead of, of the Germans. Now, uh, the, the former as aspect of those questions was, the, what was again, Alan? It was about whether the um, the Germans protested Iceland's yes. neutrality. Yes, they, uh, they did protest indeed, and uh, they did not respect Icelandic neutrality. Uh, throughout the war, uh, uh, Icelandic uh, trawlers and fishing boats and cargo ships sailed with, uh, with fish to, to, to Britain, and this was a risky occupation indeed. And uh, uh, many Icelandic... Uh, seamen lost their lives on those journeys. Uh, of course, nothing in comparison to the horrors that many nations in Europe had to endure during the war, but uh, uh, per capita, uh, Iceland lost almost as many or just about as many people as the, as the United States throughout the war. So it was, a, it was, a, a, it was a certainly uh, an aspect of the war that, that hit us. Uh, and uh, another factor, of course, Iceland was a sovereign state uh, uh, in a royal union with Denmark. The Danish king was still the sovereign in Iceland, but Iceland was on the road to full and complete independence. And uh, one way to achieve that was to make sure that the allies, that the uh, United States, Britain, and the Soviet Union would uh, recognize Icelandic independence. And that was one thing that uh, the Icelandic uh, statesmen emphasized in the discussions with Churchill uh, in, the, uh, in the summer of 1941, that Iceland was on the road to full independence, and uh, Churchill accepted that. And uh, in 1944, before the end of the war, Iceland declared full independence and got the recognition that was needed from the US, from Britain, from the Soviet Union, much to the dismay of, uh, of the Danes, I must say. But uh, this is how things work in a war. You, uh, you, uh, for Iceland, it was a matter of uh, achieving uh, a long sought after dream. And uh, it is a complex story, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, the Icelanders felt that uh, the moment had arrived to declare full independence. And the war certainly uh, uh, did not harm in that regard. So what, what's emerging is a, um, you know, a, a story of, a, of a, a true partnership. And Aidan Hennessy asks, how did Iceland help America and Britain improve its ability to engage in wartime air combat um, during the conflict? Um, well, yes. David, do you want to take that first? David, you can start. Uh, well, um, there's obviously a small airport that grows up in, in, um, uh, in the center of Reykjavik, which were the British had organized. There's uh, an American base, which I think starts during the war and then becomes more elaborate in the Cold War. But the, 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 you know, the point about Iceland that's so significant is that this is a, a place uh, with a wonderful harbor, with landing grounds, it's it right in, the, uh, in the, the center of these Atlantic lanes. And as we mentioned earlier, um, once the convoys to the Soviet Union get going, Reykjavik, uh, the harbor is the sort of mustering point for uh, ships coming from the United States, from Canada, because of course, remember, there is a huge role by, played by the Royal Canadian Navy in the Battle of the Atlantic, ships coming from Britain. This is the, the, the mustering point for these really important Arctic convoys. 
to the Soviet Union. And in recent years, Russian historians and people who've been able to get into the Russian archives have shown more and more that although the aid may not look so much in terms of a whole of the Soviet productive effort, it mattered a lot at crucial points, not just later in the war, but also in the early months. And that aid is coming, most of it, through shipping uh, convoys that uh, could not really have operated in the same way without Iceland being where it was at that right time. Yeah, I would only confirm that and uh, point out, yes, air reconnaissance, uh, weather reports, yes. and this, this gathering point uh, for, the, for the convoys. Just uh, to my back here, there's a small statue. I'll just go and get it. Mm -hmm. And it says it's a present from, from the Russians. Uh, it says here, to the memory of all sailors who served in the Arctic convoys in, in English and then in Russian. So uh, uh, I think, uh, you know, that particular aspect of the war effort, the convoys, uh, certainly uh, demonstrated the, the importance of of the uh, of of Iceland as this stepping stone, also that I mentioned uh, yeah. at the at the start of my talk. So we, we've had a question come in from Christopher Brick. Um, he points out, uh, Mr. President, that you you mentioned um, the fact that that um, President Roosevelt's son um, yes. was there in Iceland when when Churchill visited on the sixteenth of August, um, and he asked, could you comment briefly on? Roosevelt's historical reputation in Iceland today. Obviously, we've been talking about Churchill, but how, how is President Roosevelt seen? How is Eleanor Roosevelt seen, given her role in, in the foundation of the United Nations? Yes, well, um, Roosevelt is uh, remembered here as, uh, as the president who uh, was in power when Iceland became a, a fully independent republic in 1944, offering support uh, for Iceland at that uh, moment. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, I think I'm right in saying that uh, she's probably not as well remembered, but her efforts in terms of uh, the humanitarian aspect of the UN are remembered among those who have an interest in, in that story. So I believe that uh, that will stand out as it were when it comes to her reputation in Iceland. Now, uh, uh, on a more anecdotal level, uh, uh, the, the president, first president of Iceland, uh, Iceland became a republic on the 17th of June 1944, and later that year, the president who was then elected, uh, Sveit Björnsson, uh, embarked on a journey to Washington, it was the first uh, uh, visit by the Icelandic head of state to another country, uh, was warmly received, and uh, afterwards, President Roosevelt uh, donated to Iceland a presidential car, uh, as it demonstrates the uh, the uh, situation or the horrors of the war that uh, the ship that brought this car to Iceland was sunk uh, outside uh, Iceland in the waters of Iceland, uh, and. Uh, but then uh, we've got another car of the same type. I still have that uh, automobile uh, at the presidential uh, office. Now, um, that is just an anecdote to, to demonstrate the fact though that uh, Roosevelt seemed to have been fond of, of the Icelanders. And uh, that is, I think, how he is remembered here. Now, I'm, I'm going to sort of move things forward a little bit. It probably won't surprise either of you to to know that we've um, had a number of questions from people asking um, about the recent meeting between President Biden and, and Prime Minister Johnson and their decision to update or, or, or reissue the Atlantic Charter when they, when they met in, Cor in Cornwall. So the, the question is, why then was the Atlantic Charter um, such a reference point for them? Why, why, why is it in, important for them to, to, to refer back to, to that moment? Um, and what is your opinion of that decision and of the new charter? Maybe if we start with you, David, and, and, and then move to, to Goodman. Well, um, 
when Alexander Cadogan, who had started the drafting of this, got back to London um, after the meeting, um, he had to talk to his boss, who was the Foreign Secretary, Anthony Eden, and he wrote down in his diary that Eden was really, first, Eden hadn't expected this charter um, or this document, and um, the reaction to it in London had not been very positive. Um, and 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 Cadogan writes in his diary, um, you know, gather charter has been declaration has been a bit of a flop. And um, I think in 1990 for the uh, 1991 for the uh, 30, uh, 50th anniversary, I wrote a piece uh, entitled "The Atlantic Flop," because it seemed to me it summed up some of the British reactions at that time. The way the charter developed is owes a huge amount to Roosevelt himself. Roosevelt did see it as part of creating um, some ideological markers for the later part of the war. On the anniversary of the Charter, so that's the 14th of August 1942, a year later, he reiterates the, um, the declaration, uh, he reminds people of it, and he says, you know, that uh, on, on that we continue to base our hopes for a better future for the world. So Ch Roosevelt is very deliberately enlarging it from a statement about you know, what's going to happen to occupied Europe and things like that, to building it up into something which is one of the bases of post-war thinking. And that's when it leads on, as you Al mentioned, Alan, to the Declaration of United Nations in January 42. That's already happened. The UN uh, Charter, um, the, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. So it's, it's not like this was something that the British intended or Churchill intended, but I think the, the pressure and the logic of Roosevelt's determination to reshape the world order is the main reason why that has now become, the Atlantic Charter has become a shorthand for a set of values uh, that have had enduring importance and to which statesmen um, subscribe, um, uh, at least by word of mouth, even if not necessarily by uh, in practice. I mean, I don't, in all honesty, think that what uh, uh, appeared from the the meeting, the G7 meeting earlier in the year and so on, quite uh, is is on the same par as the declaration in from forty one. But it's testimony to the fact that it's a that declaration is still a benchmark for internationalism in our present day. Yeah, I mean. Uh... Maybe the listeners would benefit from me mentioning that uh, the president in Iceland is uh, head of state, uh, while we have a prime minister uh, who runs the government and uh, conducts politics on a day-to-day -day basis. So the position of president in Iceland is not similar to the US or, or France or many other countries. So, uh, so I would... I would have to be careful not to step into the world of contemporary politics uh, too eagerly. Uh, when we look back at the Atlantic Charter, it, it, it's of course a very uh, idealistic document. It demonstrates the willingness to fight for uh, the freedom uh, of those who have been deprived of that same freedom. I remember once uh, as an undergraduate student of history, I was comparing the Atlantic Charter to the, um, I think it was the uh, Declaration of Yalta in, uh, you know, a few years on. 1945, yeah. 1945. So uh, there was this phrase in the Atlantic Charter, I don't remember it word for word, where, where we speak of the need to, uh, to fight for the freedom of those who have been deprived of that freedom. Mm -hmm. But and then there's almost exactly, I think, exactly the same sentence in the Yalta Declaration, except there is this continuation in the sentence. Uh, it says, "By the oppressor of nations." So this is this is uh, this is a reference, indirect at least. That's how I thought as a very keen undergraduate student of history to the fact that you know, we're, are we going to liberate Poland? Are we going to liberate uh, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania? And that brings also to mind now because uh, have the house you mentioned David have the house as a connection to the 86 Reagan Gorbachev summit 
It also has a Baltic connection because in uh, August 1991, uh, 30 years ago, yes. uh, the uh, foreign ministers of the three Baltic countries convened in Reykjavik and signed declarations on diplomatic relations with Iceland. Mm. Uh, and that was a first at that time. So, um, you know, we see in the Atlantic Char Charter the uh, desire to fight evil, to fight tyranny, to fight oppression. Uh, we see that as well in the Alta Declaration, but uh, real politic comes in as well. So it, mm. it was a tough world and uh, it is, uh, it is, uh, it is uh, tempting or it, we must avoid the, um, the uh, temptation to, uh, to pass too harsh a judgment on, on those who were in power at that time. So you mentioned 1991, Iceland, the Icelandic foreign minister, I think played a considerable part in helping to expedite the process of, of freedom for the Baltic states in those months just before the Soviet Union broke up. Is that not right? Yes, uh, we, uh, the uh, Icelandic authorities uh, offered symbolic support and also at uh, international fora uh, encouraged the uh, leaders of bigger countries to, uh, to understand the Baltic situation, to understand that there would be no future uh, for the Baltic countries within the Soviet Union. And this, you must remember, this was at the time, uh, you know, as, as our listeners know as well, when, when uh, the Berlin Wall had collapsed, when uh, communist rule in East, Eastern Europe had collapsed, but the situation of the future of the Baltic countries was still unresolved. Uh, yeah, and of the Soviet Union. West side with Gorbachev or not. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm, so, uh, I'm yes. Conscious of the time, um, ah, and, and, and clearly the, the the conversation could go on and on. There there are there are there are questions still continuing to come in. Um, but I think there's there's perhaps one question um, um, for you, Mr. President, that we should that we should end with. And um, this is from Niels Bjer, who is in Copenhagen, um, and he asks: Are there plans to do anything to commemorate or remember Churchill's visit to to Iceland? Um, would it be possible perhaps to put up a plaque? Uh, well, I would certainly not be averse to it. Uh, we remember it here in Iceland uh, today. Uh, the uh, undisputed expert on uh, Iceland uh, and the Second World War, uh, Professor Thor Whitehead, uh, wrote a long article about this in, in one of Iceland's leading newspapers. There have been uh, interviews in, in the media, including a very good interview by Arne Sigurdsson, head of the Churchill Club in, in Iceland. Uh, a plaque would certainly be fitting. We have uh, very interesting war museums uh, up in Hvalfjörður, Whalefjord, where Churchill arrived uh, uh, on the morning of the 16th of August, and uh, some kind of plaque there or statue or whatever would be very fitting or in other places in Iceland where we, um, we uh, have museums uh, uh, reminding us of this uh, part in our history. So, uh, you know, I'll give you a political answer. Yes, I would be all for it, but let's see what happens. Yes, I mean, maybe, uh, maybe also a little statue of a cat, perhaps. <laughs> yes, let's have a statue of the cat as well, or of Churchill with a cat in his lap. Yeah. Okay. Well, you've just mentioned Arne Sigurdsson, um, the president of the Churchill Club in, in Iceland. Um, he's going to give the um, vote of thanks. Before he does, let me read out one more comment um, from the Q&A, a comment, not a question. Um, this comes from Jay Wilhelm, um, and um, it, it simply reads, how fortunate Iceland is to have such a thoughtful president. And I think those are uh, that's a comment we would all echo um, after yes, this hour. But with that, let me hand over to Arnie. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Um, it falls to me to give a vote of thanks for this uh, occasion. On behalf of the Churchill Club of Iceland, in cooperation with our mother organization, the International Churchill Society, of whom we are an affiliate, I want to thank everyone involved in preparing and promoting today's event. As it sometimes said, 
behind every overnight success is decades of preparation, not unlike Churchill's career that culminated in his leadership role during World War II that uh, we have been discussing here today. For an event like this to happen and flow without a hitch, well, we had a few hiccups. Uh, a lot of work has to happen behind the scenes, setting the schedule, coordinating everything and everyone checking facts, making plans and gathering relevant photographs. From what I gather, there were about 1000 people that signed up for, uh, to view and listen today and many, many hundreds of people showed up. And to each of and every one of, of those dedicated Churchillians, I want to convey our thanks for their interest and participation this afternoon. But I especially want to thank the principal participants today, Dr. Guðni Tiehau Johannesson, President of Iceland, and David Reynolds, Professor Emeritus of Cambridge University. And special thanks are due, of course, to Alan Packwood, OPE, Director of the Churchill Archives Center at Churchill College, Cambridge, who moderated today's event. I also want to thank Justin Reich, Executive Director of the ICS US, ICS being the International Churchill Society, and Andy Smith, Executive Director of ICS UK, as well as Ms. Una Sigvastotter, Special Advisor to the President of Iceland, for their role in making this event possible. Finally, I want to thank uh, Kat Lee, the membership and administrative coordinator for the ICS for her steady hand in making sure this event went well, as well as John David Olson, director of the digital operations for the ICS for all his work, making sure the message got out through all of ICS channels on Facebook and on the internet. And last but not least, I want to thank David Freeman, director of publications and editor of the finest publication in the world, Finest Hour, the quarterly print magazine of the International Churchill Society uh, for championing the cause of the Churchill Club of Iceland. He visited us a few years ago and has since been a loyal friend and keen supporter of our small club out here in the North Atlantic, close to the Arctic. And again, Thank you, everyone involved, and wish you a wonderful afternoon and evening wherever you are in the world. Thank you.